future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Dr. Judy WTF. I'm Dr. Judy, and with me I have my dear friend and colleague, yet once again, Dr. Barbara Pavlo. <laughs> and, uh, and, and tonight we're going to be talking about body shaming and narcissism. This is a very big problem. People are being triggered by uh, being body shamed and some of them are spinning out and and doing self-harm. And so we're going to talk about this very sad topic, a very relevant topic today in a time where it's very important to look good. Uh, And we're going to relate it to narcissism because um, as many of you know who have been tuning in, uh, narcissism is is rampant and uh to take the label off for a moment what i mean by narcissism is the people who are injured at a core level i call it the the blueprint level uh um, mother infant disconnect father infant disconnect and what happens during this period of of development is instead of being uh properly nurtured breastfed skin contact eye contact i'm now referring to John Bowlby attachment theory, how to create a healthy human psyche. When we're not um, healthy, when our psyche is not healthy, we tend to resort to um, very destructive defense mechanisms that can act to demean, devalue, and destroy other human beings. Before we get right into the material, which we have plenty of, thank you very much, Uh, I want to introduce to you who um, many of you know the mind map system that I created to help heal human disconnect, to help heal human psychopathology. And uh, please let me know when it is up there. Thank you. So the mind map was created to track childhood wounds, how they embed in us and how they uh, react within us and trigger off horrible negative core beliefs and trigger chaos and defense mechanisms and ultimately breakdowns. And we're gonna mind map body shaming today as we go through the material. We'll throw the mind map up there every now and then so that you could see how the negative core beliefs uh, play out and how they're triggered by this kind of uh, poor social behavior. So um, Dr. Barbara, welcome back. Very nice to have you back. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to be back here. And this is a very difficult subject. And, you know, in doing some research, I have actually seen that since 1984, Mm -hmm. 1984, this is 2018, people have been dieting and people have been very conscious of what they look like. Mm -hmm. And if we go back historically, there was a point in time where if you were overweight, it was a sign of rich of you being wealthy, of you, you know, being a sta- as some sort of a sa- status. Mm-hmm. And since 1984, and I think it's even earlier since Twiggy. Do you remember Twiggy? Twiggy? I sure do. Right. And, and I remember everybody would say, oh, my God, she looks like a twig. And yeah. is this what women are going to look like? Because yeah. prior to that, if you were size 12 or a 14, I think Marilyn Monroe was even a 12 or a 14. And considered, of course, till today, very beautiful. Exactly. Do you know what happened in 1984 that shifted this? Well, in 1984, all of a sudden, I I really think it became very big business that people were more interested 
in uh, w- what you would eat, and they started bad mouthing butter, and they started bad mouthing foods like natural foods. And there's so many diets now uh-huh. that talk about going back to natural eating mm-hmm. and um, caveman diet or something of that effect. Right, the paleo diet. Paleo diet, right. exactly. Okay. And they started talking about margarine, which actually mm-hmm. actually creates fat and does not do a body good. But really, that's when everybody started becoming unhappy and aware of what they look like. I mean, I think it's very important to feel healthy and to have good health. But this craziness, I mean, there is a percentage here um, of the idolized woman that we look at in a magazine Mm -hmm. is actually uh, 20% below a healthy weight. That's the idolized woman. And, yes. and I notice that styles change. There are periods of time where um, large is better, large busts, large butts, uh, larger men, and so on. And then there are periods of time, it's almost like the styles change. And this goes across gender. So not only is body shaming a problem, uh, for women, it's a problem for men as well. And uh, just to share a little bit about my practice at the Psychological Healing Center, I have had clients who have such a huge extent of body dysmorphic disorder, meaning that they're distorted in their perception of themselves. And so it's not so much how much a person weighs, it's more how they see themselves. Because somebody, just the other day, I had a very, very nice looking uh, person in my treatment room and the person focused in on something wrong with his his skin and something wrong with his eyes and of course I couldn't see any any of that but that's what I refer to as the cracked lens of perception and we're going to mind map that in in a little while but this is growing epidemic it is a growing epidemic, and last week we talked about suicide mm-hmm. and, you know, cyberbullying. And if you don't feel good about yourself, we always talk about core beliefs. And if your core belief is, I'm not lovable, and someone goes to your Achilles heel, and narcissists seem to know what that Achilles yes, heel they is, do. they right. go right for it. Like if, if you have a problem thinking your hair is too thin right. or or your, your, your breasts aren't large enough, or as a man, your arms aren't big enough, and narcissist is going to attack that yes. and then it's going to confirm your negative core belief that's not even true to begin with and if you're not stable and you don't have a good support system you are at risk for suicide so so let's track how this psychovirus gets in there and i do call it a psychovirus because when we're babies when we're children we are permeable membranes we're very vulnerable We soak everything in, and uh, verbal and nonverbal cues are registered. And it doesn't just have to be verbal cues, because a lot of um, therapies concentrate on the cognitive and the verbal, which is fine. It's just that if the nonverbal, the preverbal, isn't addressed, then you're not really going to be getting to the cause. So imagine being a baby, and maybe mom isn't really that attentive to you, or maybe as you go get a little bigger, dad or brother or somebody starts saying, did you notice that your butt is too big? And why would a child really notice that necessarily? But now that it's been called to their attention, they will notice that. And it'll go with a conglomeration of other negative core beliefs they may have about themselves, like maybe they believe because of verbal abuse, negative messages, that they're not pretty enough. Or maybe they believe that they're not lovable. Or maybe they believe that they're not even wanted. And children have an interesting way of reframing all of that to make it to mean that there's something there's something wrong with them, rather than seeing it as, you know, my parents are not the best parents in the world. They don't have the greatest parenting skills. Children don't think that way. They think right away, there's something wrong with me. As children, we're very egocentric, so it's very egocentric. So it's really, really important to understand that when it comes to um, body shaming, it's kind of like the first few years of life in our blueprint, our family of origin, set the pawns up. And the other thing I want to add, you're exactly correct, 
is that there is no other people in the life of the child. It's not like when you grow older and you have friends, you have outside support systems that could say, she said, your mom said, what? No, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. that's not right. And you kind of could bounce it off. You're a captive audience. You're you're really there. And whatever your parents tell you, you absorb like a sponge. Exactly. And then what happens is, as you talk about, because you believe that about yourself, you project that. If I'm insecure about myself, my body language I'm going to be you know looking at people so people are going to say oh she's kind of weird and that's Mm -hmm. going to confirm my false belief about myself and there's the self-fulfilling prophecy right and so that we may start off not knowing and then we're fed information and then we're triggered by that information and then we react to that trigger and then everybody sees our weird reactions and behaviors and play into these weird reactions and behaviors. And you're very right. Somehow people who like to demean, devalue, and destroy, these are the three Ds of people who lack empathy and uh, use this ugly defense, defense mechanism, which we refer to in our profession as the narcissistic defense. Uh, people who use this kind of mechanism, they just know how to dig right in there and then they can manipulate and start um, using that person as narcissistic supply. And the other thing that I want to add to all of you listening out there, that the narcissist is, as Judy said, going to use you as supply, but the narcissist is always right. So for those of you that are lacking self-confidence or question your own self-confidence, the narcissist is going to make sure that you feel inferior because the only person that knows anything is the narcissist. Because they're always They're superior. always right and right. they're superior. Right. And if someone disagrees with a narcissist, it's not because they're wrong because they're never wrong. It's because you're jealous of what they Mm. have or what they know. Mm -hmm. So bear that in mind, a narcissist is very difficult for an ego, any ego, to deal with. And just also remember when we throw these labels around, what, what, what we're meaning about that is people who are injured. They're injured because they yes. don't get these supplies. And so when they don't get these supplies and they don't have what uh, what we call object constancy, they don't have that uh, ability, they don't take in the good enough mothering, they don't take in the nurturing, they don't, what we don't take in, we don't have to give. So then the other way to play this game of life then is to demean, devalue, manipulate, make ourselves feel better by making others feel worse. And this is a call-in show, folks. So uh, please call in. The number is 323-843-2826. And please pick our brain. Uh, We have uh, Dr. Barbara Pavlo here. And uh, we're talking about body shaming and narcissism and the tragedy of the uh, effects of of extreme cyberbullying as well, which is a form of, uh, of a methodology for doing this kind of shaming because now that we have all of this social media, it's really easy to poke at people because uh, there they are and uh, then they can rack up the, they could ramp up the, uh, the shame that people are already so prone to. Yes. And you know what? The thing about people knocking somebody's looks is often not even the issue. And people target somebody's looks because it's a lot easier to say, you're ugly, you're fat, you're too skinny, rather than you hurt my feelings. So bear in mind, people that are recipients of this type of harassment, this Mm -hmm. type of bullying, Mm -hmm. is is not about you as much as the person who's accusing you of all of this. Yes, I I pulled a couple of articles. We both pulled articles. And one of the articles is by CBS News, Body Image Issues and Teen Suicide. Suicidal impulses and attempts are much more common in teenagers who think they are too fat or too thin regardless of how much they actually weigh a study found so it's not what they actually weigh it's the self perception which i call the cracked lens of perception because when we see straight then uh then we don't go down the rabbit hole of um of, of being susceptible to being demeaned devalued and destroyed and as a matter of fact 
um, the research shows that, that these, these people uh, perceive themselves as either weight extreme. So even though they may not be extreme at all, it's the body dysmorphic perception. And of course, if their, um, their norm is uh, Twiggy back in 1984, or if their norm is somebody that is, uh, what's the word when you're computer generating and there's a lot of cleaning up of images when people do modeling and they, they're photographed for magazines. Photoshopped. They're, they're really right. photoshopped. So we're comparing yes. our worst to people's photoshopped best. Exactly. Photoshopped best. <laughs> you know, you just talked about adolescence, and I mm -hmm. pulled something from the CDC, Center of Disease Control, in okay. 2004. And children, these are children in grades 9 to 12, which mm -hmm. is generally 14 to 18 years of, old, uh, of age, more than 60% of the females and 30% of the males were trying to lose weight. And what At they did... age 9? No, Grade nine, grade fourteen nine, to grade eighteen. Nine. Okay. Still, children. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. They go without food for for twenty four hours or mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. Totally unhealthy. Okay. Shuts the body down. Mm -hmm. They use diet pills, mm -hmm. uh, vomit, and takes la takes. Okay. okay. So can laxatives. you see? Can you see how this issue reverberates? So now we're we're not just talking about body shaming and body dysmorphic. We're talking about the side effects of of this way of perception, which is now um, using laxatives, uh, bulimia, so on, uh, resorting to um, self-medication if they're not too happy with themselves, uh, resorting to uh, maybe getting involved prematurely in relationships because the relationship is supposed to esteem them. And then if they're vulnerable, they may get involved in, you know, I talk a lot about the WTF cycle, the what the Freud cycle. So they may very well be susceptible to getting involved in a relationship where they will be body shamed. So here they are trying to make up for the shame that they're feeling, make up for the lack of self-esteem, and they may just very well go right into the hands of somebody who will, let's say, um, have sex with them or... Um, yeah, and then and then well, become and pregnant, then, and become shame pregnant. Them. Yes, because now they feel like they belong to somebody. Mm -hmm. They could have this family, mm -hmm. and it, it's it's such a recipe for a disaster. It really, really is because people are searching for an identity. You know, there's healthy shame and unhealthy shame. Please, I know you did some right. research around this. And by the way, we are interruptible. If you'd like to call in, please call in. 323-843-2826. John Bradshaw mm -hmm. talks about healthy shame. And healthy shame is actually when you blush, when you get embarrassed. Mm -hmm. It's a learning opportunity. You know, I want to speak to the audience and say, does anyone think they're perfect? Because if you're perfect, please call in. Because perfection <laughs> does not exist. No one has a perfect body. Nobody has a perfect face. Nobody has anything perfect. We're human beings. Right there, it kills the notion of perfect. So healthy shame is really a matter of, oh, I messed that up. Oh, I can do better. What can I learn? Unhealthy shame, on the other hand, is a totally different entity. And where unhealthy shame comes in, that's where they see it as being bankrupt of the soul. Mm -hmm. How dare you say that I was wrong? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What happens is that... It takes away my spirit because you've damaged me mm -hmm. because I didn't do something perfect. Yes. Self-scrutiny, worthless, feeling defective. Now, if let's just wave a magic wand and let's pretend that everyone went through an intense mind map course and now all of the shadows of the past are no longer infiltrating into the fiber of our being and there's a lot of um, this code of negativity and wounds removed, then a healthy person wouldn't stand for this kind of treatment, okay? So you see the difference, and I was just talking about this in a therapy session, people who have negative core beliefs identify with these negative core beliefs. 
rather than identify the core beliefs. So and they I'm going to make a big deal about this, but go ahead. Go they ahead. also enlist them from others. Yes. You know, if you're not putting me down, then right. I'm going to tell you, Judy, look at how disgusting I look. Do you see this pimple? Mm-hmm, Do you see mm-hmm. how fat I look? Mm-hmm. Do you see how ugly I look? And if Do I don't my- participate and you have that negative core belief, then what? If I say to you, "Oh no, Barbara, you're 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 nuts. You you're you're a beautiful woman," then you see how the two don't really line up. So if the other person feels this way about themselves, then they may even think that the other is lying to them, that they're being disingenuous. So there's no uh, way for that compliment or that information to really penetrate through. But I I just want to put a little more emphasis on this concept of identifying the core belief rather than identifying with the core belief. In the case of body shaming, they're identifying with the core belief. I'm ugly, I'm fat, I'm disgusting, whatever it is. My nose is too big, my skin is too wrinkled, whatever it is. And so because they believe this to be true, then again, the the dominoes are are, are set. When you identify the core belief rather than with the core belief, then you um, you can have a healthy outside perspective of what it is that you bought into. Like, wow, because my parents kept repeating to me how stupid and ugly I I am all my life. I bought into this. And now look at me. Now I am easily toppled over and thrown into chaos because I'm triggered in, if you could put this up, panel three, which is the negative core belief. And then when we're triggered in our panel three, boom, boom, boom. What the Freud? Okay, and that's the breakdown. And the breakdown definitely will continue in a WTF manner until these feelings are reprocessed and the lies are exposed. And that individual can own the fact that these uh, lies were incorporated uh, in, they were soaked in from the get go from the first few years of life. Yes, but you know something, you know, we could talk about it as as therapists, as psychologists, yeah. because we help people, but people are so resistant. And for those of you that are thinking about coming in and getting some help, you have to understand that it's a huge battle, because what we're telling you to do is identify your core belief. And oftentimes, even though the core belief is negative, Who are you without your core belief? And that becomes a scary thought. It's like I've always thought of myself as a skinny little runt. And, you know, that's just who I am. And people adapt to me and they, you know, play into that with me because it is the people I surround myself with Mm -hmm. because they believe my core beliefs. Mm -hmm. But if I get rid of that, you mean I can be an actual high functioning individual who doesn't have to look at myself like that? And that's Mm -hmm. scary in some ways, but it is freeing. Why put a label on yourself that you never deserve to begin with? Because you, because your point is well taken that we like to have a self identity. And so I, I believe that a part of the process of therapy is to empty out and rather than just quickly put in a positive, which is uh, very, I think, cognitive behavioral therapy, substitute the negative for the positive. I'm not a big fan of that because I think that if we have some faith, we can empty out and then let that new blank slate state start to develop and grow. If we're too quick to put in a positive, I think, again, it's putting a Band-Aid over the situation. And I think it's kind of creating a false self. And sometimes we just have to be with the emptiness and be with the fear of the unknown. And uh, and just like when we're infants and we, we don't know who we are, we haven't been, uh, we haven't developed, we have to trust that when we get rid of that darkness and that negativity and just let that be and not and then and and may I add put up appropriate boundaries then we have a way to screen out people and comments and ideas and beliefs that are not going to be life enhancing and that brings up another issue Mm -hmm. as we bring up boundaries people are familiar 
even if it isn't a good feeling, it's a feeling that they possess. So they're familiar with it. So if I have all my friends that body shame me, make fun of me, do all kinds of things, and then I meet you, Mm -hmm. I'm going to look at you as, she's kind of weird. She's not like anyone else I know. Not familiar. Right. Why do we marry, you know, somebody familiar who may not be the best person for us? So, you know, it, it really goes into all facets of our life. And, and look at the statistics. About 19% of people have considered suicide in the previous year, and about 9% said they had attempted it because of this perception that they have of themselves, this distorted perception. So if you're a parent, let's do a little bit of preventative. Uh, there are five childhood wounds that I talk about. There's verbal abuse, there's physical abuse, there's sexual abuse, there is uh, neglect, and then there is smothering. And so if you are a parent, it is very important to uh, heal thyself so that you don't project these feelings onto your own children. And especially with name calling and verbal abuse, you are really, really setting them up for uh, uh, drawing people into their lives that will do same. Again, the WTF, the what the Freud. So this is a call-in show. I'm reminding you, we do love call-ins. 323-843-2826. The subject is body shaming, narcissism, how a narcissist is very perceptive in recognizing the frailties, the weakness of the other person, and they just go right in there. They zing right in there. And the other thing with parents, you know, you can't give what you don't have. Right. And we talked about this a little bit last week, how important it is for people to nurture themselves Mm -hmm. and take care of themselves. The more you feed yourself, the more you give yourself, the more you have to give others. And if you are a parent, you really have to understand how important it is to take care of yourself so that you do have patience, that you do have reflection, and that you can give your children something. Because, you know, we all think, oh, they're so little, one, two, they don't know what's going on. They do. They do. At a nonverbal level, they're picking up on that. If you have a one-year-old and you're ignoring that one-year-old and they're crying and their needs are not being met, they're going to grow up thinking that they're not worthy, and their core belief is, who cares about me? And, and you know, it could be really subtle. For example, a parent yes. might say, you know, when you were born, you had the biggest nose, or you, you looked like a skinny little runt, or boy, were your ears ever like Dumbo ears. And they think that it's sweet and innocent. They, they, they don't even understand the impact. But then, cut two years later, and that uh, adolescent now thinks that she's a monster. So not that plastic surgery is, 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 is not a good idea for some people in certain cases, but th- th- there's so much plastic surgery going on. If you don't have the perfect nose, if you don't have the pinned back ears, if you don't have the perfect body, let's just um, go to a plastic surgery. Very big business these days. And let's not forget that the media plays into this big time. And with all of the, uh, the what's what's it called when they, you just said it before. Photoshopping. The, fo- the photoshopping. We have a new norm of what's beauty. Yes. And I think we have a call in. Hi, you are on the couch with Dr. Judy and Dr. Barbara. Yeah, hi. 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 Uh, I just have a, um, a question. I know you're kind of getting into a parenting um, and learning about, how your methods are and uh, reading your book. Um, It's it's becoming really more aware. It's it's like it's just my cracked lens of perception. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like it's getting more clear, more clear. Beautiful. But with Mm -hmm. that, but with that, Mm -hmm. it now it's like, oh my gosh, you know, what have I done to my children? Oh yeah. That's the most. And what -hmm. what gets me (laughs) is what's getting me more right now is the Mm -hmm. guilt. The guilt. Okay. All right. So um, your your name, you can use any name you wish. What is your name, please? John. Okay. So, uh, and uh, I'm just curious what state you're calling from. I always like to know where, where people are from. Illinois. 
Illinois. Okay. So I think the fact that you're feeling these feelings speaks really highly of you as a parent. Okay. First of all, whenever you go on a journey of discovery, you may th discover things about yourself that are not very pretty. And the fact that they're distasteful to you right now is wonderful. Okay, I know that sounds crazy, mm -hmm. but it's fantastic because what you're doing is you're shedding your old self. You're saying, you know, who I was being and how I was being is no longer acceptable. And it is a morphing process. And so rather than shaming and blaming yourself for what you did, how about recognizing that it's a very courageous thing to peel back the curtain of truth, as I like to say, and I think I even say it in my book, yes? Yeah. Okay, yes. the truth light, shining, you're shining the truth light on things, and that always will bring up feelings. And so I, I, I really admire people who are willing to do that because it hurts, and it brings up self-shame mm -hmm. and self-blame. So, I, you know, I congratulate you for that. Okay, that you're willing. Yeah, I willing. appreciate that. Yeah, you're willing and, and to so do I, this. I have, I, and I've talked to my kids. I have two two kids, but mm -hmm. and I've asked them, you know, and they both said that I was a good father. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, because I had to make a tremendous amount of change, even before they were born, and then after they were born. Okay. You know, I said, "Wow, a lot of things really have to change." Sure. Um, but the two, the two big mistakes that I made was the two women that I became involved with. First was the mother. Okay. And then when we didn't work out, I basically found someone exactly like the first first time around. Yep. And these women were very, very damaging. Okay. And um to your more, to your children? So borderline. Oh, oh borderline. Okay. We've done a lot of episodes on that. How how yeah, long and have... I was always trying to go in and fix things, you sure, know, and sure. I was so I've always found the person that I wanted to help fix or help just help 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 yeah and it turned out to me what i've learned about borderline and i know that's a label but it it seemed like they really had they both had a lot of narcissism as well yes um, yes because it seemed like they really just lacked empathy yes and a lot of a, a lot of times these people are so dysregulated that they'll dysregulate people around them and if your children For are sure. around them they'll dysregulate your children and so a, a person who's interested in their own mental health and growth are courageous enough to start questioning things which is what you're doing yeah. how how long ago did you purchase the book um, it was about a year ago. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're well done with the book, yes? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I read the book, and, I, I mean, of course, I watch the show, um, almost try to watch it every week. So Thank I'm you. So I'm trying to learn, learn, learn. Yeah. But it seems like, like, like I said lately, it's just when you have that awareness of, and, and, and it, it, it seems like, man, there's a really, there's a lot of uh, really messed up people out there. I mean... Yes. It's amazing that when you went, you know, I just I just had a neighbor friend over here and uh, we just met a few months ago and we just started talking about cars, like to work on cars. But, he, uh, uh, you know, I thought he was just a regular guy, you know, house and da 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 da. But mm -hmm. then I started talking to him about his past and he just had a just a horrific past. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it, it's just I'm like, wow, you know, I mean, when I was looking at you and talking to you, it seemed like everything was normal and fine. And then, you know, you start to talk with people about their backgrounds. It's like, it's um, wow, there's a, just a so, lot of very damaged people out there. So so just curious, because the topic is body shaming and narcissism. What shifted for you in, in so far as your way with your children what was there a period of time when you were loose with oh honey you're a little fat or your nose is too big or your you know your 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 skin is too pimply or whatever was there a time when you noticed well, that you actually, were doing that it was really the opposite okay it, it was the opposite of body shaming it okay was, um, okay you know i i try was uh, i tried very very hard to make sure i said a lot of positive things to them so mm -hmm. i mean it, it's it's the opposite so i know i know your show is titled body shaming but for me, it was the opposite. It was I, the I was opposite. Very so, keen into saying very positive things to my children. So, if I may ask, what is bringing so much shame and embarrassment to you as you discover some of the things that were not as wonderful as as you know that, that you're looking at yourself now? What what is bringing up uh, pain within you and embarrassment? 
Well, it's just it's just that for me it was it, like I said it was just a guilt um, because I realized I made some really bad decision mm-hmm. in in who I was um, partnered with. Yeah. Okay. I got you. And those gotcha. partners, mm-hmm. um, I know they had a lot of damaging effects on my children. Okay. And and I think and what... that's the guilt because I I'm the one who made the decision. They were children. They were innocent. Absolutely. And, and I, I made the decision. And I know that one. if I wanted to talk about body shaming, um, the mother of my daughter, biological mother, she uh, she said something to where, um, oh, gosh, like, you know, why are you always wearing black? And she mm-hmm. was just a young girl, but she liked mm-hmm. wearing black, the yep. color black. Yeah. And um, not sure what it was about, but she would, so she would come over to my house and she said, well, my mom says, you know, why I'm always wearing black or this, that, and the other. And, and I would try to turn it around. And I said, well, I think black is beautiful. I mm-hmm, think it looks mm-hmm. very nice on you. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. But it, it seems like I, I, it, 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 I mean, there were words and hopefully they went in, but it seems like the more, the more powerful force was what her mom was saying to her. Yes, and I, I understand that you were trying to um, neutralize the effects yes, of it, it. and yep. and uh, as you know by listening to all the tapes, when we have a, a poor blueprint, meaning our mothers and our fathers and our multi generations um, have certain behaviors or certain ways of speaking and injuring us, we tend to repeat. So I'm really impressed that you're willing to dig in and look at yourself, and that you're considering. Um, you know, that you've entered into painful things that were not so pretty about yourself. And that's how we grow. I, my favorite way yeah. of growing is self-reflect and self-correct. We have to. If we exactly. don't, we stay right. stuck. You know, I'd like to add something as well. You know, you're reflecting on mistakes that you made. And the operative word yeah. here is made. You know, after listening and reading Dr. Judy's book, I doubt you're going to invite a partner into your life with those mm-hmm. same characteristics that you did. That's very true. It won't happen again. <laughs> right, right. It so, won't happen again. I'm, I'm staying. I'm actually staying single until they, I get my so all my stuff okay. okay my crack okay. lens of perception very clear. <laughs> Good okay. for you. But see, that's huge because had this not have happened, had you not have read her book, had you not have been such a loyal listener, you'd be in the same boat. So we have to acknowledge who we are when we make certain decisions and we're not always that same person luckily you're one of the few that actually got out and did something to make things better for yourself so give yourself a pat on the back yeah. for that yeah i yeah. appreciate you saying that and that and yeah. uh, you know sometimes you just need to hear some truthful words you know from professionals and good human beings like yourselves to say hey Thank you. i'm on the right track but definitely yes. Yes. Yeah, the, the last time around, uh, the second time around, I'm just like, wow, something has to change. And I really need to start looking at myself. But it, mm-hmm. uh, again, it was just just it was just when you become more self-aware and like, oh, my God, it, it, you know, you look at what happened to your own children. You never want to hurt your children. Right. You know, one one of the um, topics that I was discussing today in in therapy was the fact that once you have that paradigm shift, which is what you're having, you're, you're beginning to mm-hmm. see things straight, you can't go back because it's like riding a bicycle. You can't unlearn something that right. you've just seen. Right. You can't. So once right. you wake up to that, there's no going back. So, um, so I really appreciate you calling in, and thank you so much for mm-hmm. being such a an avid listener. And for those of you who don't know, I'm currently working on the mind map video series, which is being edited. And I'm getting kind of frustrated because I want it to be all edited already. And it's just going to take its its time whenever it's ready. And you well, can, when is that coming out? I'd like to, uh, uh, I, ho- I hope this month and you can go on lo- okay. You can go on my website, drjudywtf.com or psychologicalhealingcenter.com. And right. if you go to resources and mine and you scroll down to mind map video series, there's a very intricate description of what it is and what it comes with because literally I spent a lot of hours in front of that camera breaking down panel one through nine uh, with an introduction and a case study 
and some fun things like my grandson uh, doing the mind map uh, through the eyes of a child. So I think it's going to be a very interesting piece, uh, and I look forward to feedback from everybody about it. So I'm thinking in the next few weeks, but do check it out online yeah. and, and just kind of get a feel for what it is, okay? I've had the pleasure okay. well, of actually you. seeing it, and I have to tell you, it's fantastic. Thank I you. I think oh, you much. did such a good job, mm -hmm. and she really explained things in detail, and there's some humor to it, and she has uh, her dog in it and her grandson, and it, it's really very good, and I think it's very worthwhile. Thank you. So it is something that... Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Judy, and thank you. You're, you're very Dr. welcome. Barbara. Thank you again. Yes. Have, have a good, a good evening. Have thank a good you. Okay, bye. bye. Okay. Okay, so, you know, this topic of body shaming, it goes far because it's not just the body shaming, it's all kinds of psychological injuries. And I can't tell you how many patients that I see, and I'm sure you as well, who talk about the way their parents perceived them. Oh, my God, when you were a little girl, I don't know what was wrong with your eyes. I think you were cross-eyed or, you know, there's something wrong with your the shape of your legs. I think you were a little clubfoot. And these things stick in a child's brain I never so thought profoundly. You, I never thought you'd grow any hair. You look like a boy. You, you weren't. De no, I didn't hear it. Yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, I never thought you would develop. You know, you're so flat-chested. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. These are the women that are going out, and mm -hmm. they can't give the plastic surgeon enough money. Yeah. And there's nothing that makes them feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And then we go into body dysmorphic. You know, first it's, this is the first stage, but... Go ahead and finish Huge your belief. thought, and we have another caller. Okay, go okay. ahead. Okay, yes, you're on the couch with Dr. Barbara and Dr. Judy. Hi, Dr. Judy. I've got to turn you down, but um, you've got to tell your camera person to do not zoom in on you. When they zoom in on you, your mic goes complete echo. Oh, really? Okay, I'll try yeah. to do this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so you got that, Yes. Tech support. And, okay. Yes. Yeah. Do okay. not do not zoom in on Dr. Judy. Every time you do, it goes complete echo. It's probably half the tape. Wow. But, um, okay. Thanks very much for that. I, pr I appreciate um, it. Okay. What What effect can uh, third parties have on a on a on a shamed child, like uh, teachers or, or 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 somebody? How do How do they counter that? I think. Th just... Okay. Great question. I call it an enlightened witness, and depending on the level of power that that person has over a child. I think that when a child is in it, you know, when they're at the effect of, I call it, rather than at the cause of, and they have someone that they admire and respect, like a grandmother, an aunt, a teacher, uh, someone who uh, who's truly got their back, and that person turns to them and says, you know, Johnny, I think that what your mother just said to you was very injurious. Um, I'm sure that didn't leave you feeling very well. And so I encourage that level of enlightened witness and the, the level of damage control because sometimes children are just so into uh, taking the information from, quote, the source, their parents, that they need another source and they need another mirror, so to speak. And so if, if, if that other mirror is a person that they can trust who can lend a better um, perception to the situation, super, super helpful and healthy. Great question. Well, you know, the last caller was talking about his par past partner choices and they were injurious to his children. And then I think when dad comes along and says, no, you're okay, they don't trust dad's word as much because they know dads always say good things, hopefully. Yeah. And yeah. maybe a third party would be better, but... But maybe, maybe his, if he, to alleviate the guilt, maybe he should have his uh, daughters call you. I think that would be a great idea. And you're very, you're very aware that these messages go in. That's why I call them the psychovirus, because they go deep in there and they reverberate. So you're right. If a mother says such things about her own children and the father tries to mitigate that psychovirus is already in there. And that's why the mind map process is really geared to, quote, uh, expunge those feelings, those hurtful feelings, so that the person can process those feelings and not wear them inside or project them on other people. 
Um, but that's an excellent question because for those of you who are witnessing children being abused, body shamed, uh, whatever level is taking place, if you can stand there and be that enlightened witness, you could be a lifesaver, literally a lifesaver. Thank you well, very much for you. that. I appreciate your show. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very much appreciate you calling. Okay. Another call in? Oh, we're on a roll here. Um, you're on the couch with Dr. Judy and Dr. Barbara. Hi. What's your name, please? Hi, Dr. Judy and Dr. Barbara. My name is Greg. Uh, I've talked to you before, Dr. Judy. Hi, Greg. Hi. Nice to, nice to hear you again. This is Greg from Michigan. Okay, okay, um, very nice to hear I'm, your voice. Okay. I'm happy to let you know I'm in my final actual course of my PhD program. Wow, congratulations. This is Greg the loser, right? This is he. Oh my God. Okay, so just a little <laughs> history here. Greg lost how many pounds? Uh, about. 300 and some pounds. Yeah. Uh, uh, remarkable, remarkable history here. Um, we spoke, I think, originally years ago, didn't we? And your negative core belief was screaming and blocking you from progress. And Greg, the loser, now lost 300 pounds and has a PhD. And di didn't you do your dissertation on anxiety and something? Redirect, yeah, redirecting anxious energy to facilitate performance. Yeah, unbelievable. I'm just so impressed. And so fantastic. here's, yeah, speaking fantastic. of, yeah, <laughs> fantastic. And sometimes when people um, uh, have symptoms of extreme weight gain, right? I, I'm just curious, what was your negative core belief, if you don't mind sharing that? My nev negative core belief was my entire existence. Your entire existence. And what did it sound like? Your panel three sounded like, I'm not blah, blah, blah. What, what was it? Um, just, you know, I, I, one thing that sticks out, um, I can remember my mom telling me there was a song out and I can remember her singing the song on the radio. She said, this song is about you. And the song was, you're no good. You're no good. You're no good. Was that Lin Linda Ronstadt? Ronstadt? I uh, might've been, might've been. I, I think I, I know, I know what out. you mean. <laughs> wow. How old were you when she first told you that song was about you? Uh, I don't know, maybe five, six, or seven. Wow. I don't know, somewhere around there. So you always believe that? Oh, yeah. Oh, it started way before that. Like I told Dr. Judy, my earliest memories are being um, smacked to the ground and, and kicked from one end of the kitchen to the other. And, uh, um, you know, I just knew there was never a place for me in, in the family. I mean, we moved mm -hmm. uh, to a new house and Everybody had beds and bedrooms, and I had the floor and the slab and the uh, cold room. That's where that's where I wow. slept. It's just such an unbelievable journey from <laughs> through to. And also, you recently got married, right? I mean, so so Beautiful. Greg the loser lost three hundred pounds, got his PhD, finishing up the dissertation, or finished it and got married. That's all, right? That's all. <laughs> Mildly interesting, you know. People do this every day, of you know. Course. <laughs> no biggie. So uh, impressive. I should let I should let uh, Dr. Barber know at the beginning of this. I was uh, <clears throat> I had mobility issues for three and a half years. I was on neither crutches or in bed. So um, and now I'm coaching wrestling and uh, back to my roots. Wow. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, and I've had some amazing <laughs> emails from Greg, which I, I've always appreciated so much. And, and just curious, being that we're on the subject of body shaming, did anybody shame you in, in terms of your body at the time uh, before you started putting the weight on or maybe as you I, were putting the weight on? <clears throat> what was going on there? I've, I've, always, I've always been larger than my peers mm -hmm. be it tall and even you know i was the husky kid back when i was when i was younger mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. i remember my first day of kindergarten uh, being held back and said you're in the wrong line because i was bigger than everybody else and i yeah. had to walk home from my first day of school yeah, yeah. um it was kind of crazy um 
I remember my brothers taking me to play football, and I couldn't play because I was too big. Wow. And, and, um, who, and who criticized you? Did anybody? Did anybody uh, dig everybody. in? Everybody. Right. And so everybody. I'm sure we know that when people criticize us, do we want to eat less or do we want to eat more? Um, I think we end up eating more by ourselves. Yeah. Right. Right. So um, what do you think? I think uh, we're in uh, denial. We, we'll never admit that to anybody, but that stranger inside us that we share that with, you know? Mm-hmm. I um, wonder, what, Greg, go ahead. you know, Greg. since I don't know you and obviously uh, Judy knows you pretty well, just real quickly, uh, could you just give me a summary of what it was? What was the impetus to change your life around? I mean, you've made some major changes. What do you think happened that changed for you? My wife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, it was meeting now her? You, now you get me choked up. That's um, okay. Uh, That's for, nice. For the, mm-hmm. for the first time in my life, <clears throat> someone truly believed in me. Wow. And I was wow. 55 years old. Wow. Well, never, um, ever, ever give up. Anybody, ever. Right. I just, Yeah. And speaking of that enlightened witness, that person standing beside us, what do we want most of all is we want human connection. And human connection is really the key to um, mental health. It's really the key Mm -hmm. to healing, isn't it? So, well. And that's where Dr. Judy was a big part of it. You know, I identified the broken lens. And from that point forward, it was... Just a matter of time, you know, with my deductive reasoning, critical thinking, it, yeah. it was the logical um, path for me to go and realize that, you know, I don't have to look at myself in that same lens. And then and once uh, and once that perception cracks, right, then we don't have to go through that self-fulfilling prophecy because when we believe that we're this and that, <clears throat> bad, ugly, stupid, whatever it is, then it is self-fulfilling because it creates and reinforces the hole in the soul. And then when it does that, then we eat more or we do more uh, substances or we shut down harder, We whatever it is that we do to defend. So clearly your number one healthy defense mechanism was human connection and love. And as I like to say, unconditional love is the, uh, the most healing force on the planet. So I really, really appreciate you keeping in touch. I love to hear from you. And it's always so exciting to me to know that you're, you've shifted in a, in a major, major way. So yeah, write me, call there, there, me, keep in touch. Oh, absolutely. There, there's, there's what this, you know, I got my email, my reminder, you know, and I saw what the topic was and there was, and this really intrigued me from a different perspective. And yes. it's something I mentioned to my wife not too long ago. Okay. And it was um, just how you, when you casually encounter people now, how differently they look at me. Of course. And how differently they engage with me or interact with me. Where before it was almost like a herd mentality. They didn't want to make eye contact um, or engage with me. And now that I'm quote unquote normal um it's it's amazing how the people that would normally like avert their eyes and just minimal engagement will Mm -hmm. actually you know make that attempt and it it just blows my mind to see that what a difference and and how horrible i i perceive how i was treated now but Mm -hmm. like you know Mm -hmm. it, it made me what i am now it made me stronger and i bet it's not just because you look different it's also that you're exuding something different as well which is uh, the opposite of the self-fulfilling prophecy in a downward spiral, spiral way. You're, you're evolving, not devolving. So I know we're kind of short on time. We're going to go to oh, our just, shrink that tune tonight. Judy, I just want to say one thing to you, Gregory. Um, I've treated a yeah. lot of patients that have had gastro bypass, and uh-huh. there's actually an anger that they feel towards people that would ignore them before because of their weight, and now they were engaging and almost flirtatious. So I don't know if you feel that too, but all of those are I, such. I, I, 
I don't, and you know, I, through my therapy, one of the mechanisms I have is not is not that because I came from an abused background, and I kind of look at it like that was their loss. Their loss. That, for that good for you. Was there mm-hmm. the whole time. Good for you. Well, you sound uh, really healthy, and uh, I, <laughs> I, I really am so glad all the time to hear from you. I'm gonna go to the shrink that tune tonight because okay, we I'm only have a little. No, it's okay. It's great to hear from good you. Good luck to you, yes. and thank you for sharing your story. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. You're Thank welcome. You, Dr. Barbara. You're welcome. Bye. Good night. Okay, so we're going to go to Beyonce's Pretty Hurts lyrics. Okay, so uh, Mama said you're a pretty girl. What's in your head? It doesn't matter. Brush your hair, fix your teeth. What you wear is all that matters. Just another stage. Pageant the pain away, the superficial. The time I'm going to I'm going to take the crown without falling down. Down pretty hurts. Shine the light on whatever's worst. Perfection is the disease of a nation. Pretty hurts. So apropos to what we've been talking about. Shine the light on whatever's worst. Tina, trying to fix something. But you can't fix what you can't see. It's the soul that needs the surgery. So there it is, the hole in the soul. It's not the outside. It's really our courage to go inside there and deal with it. Vogue says, thinner is better, just another stage. Pageant the pain away. This time I'm going to take the crown without falling down. Down, pretty hurts. Shine the light on whatever's worse. Perfection is the disease of a nation. Pretty hurts. The pain's inside and nobody frees you from your body. It's the soul. It's the soul that needs surgery. It's my soul that needs surgery. Plastic smiles and denial can only take you so far. The fake self ain't going to cut it. Then you break when the fake facade leaves you in the dark. You left a shattered mirror and the shards of a beautiful girl pretty hurts. Shine the light on whatever's worst. Perfection is the disease of a nation. It's the soul that needs the surgery. When you're alone all by yourself and you're lying in your bed. What do you think of that song, Dr. Barbara? I think that song, there were a couple of uh, lines in here that uh, really made a lot of sense here. And I like the part where it's your soul. Yeah, it's your soul that needs the fixing. It's your soul. So we could plaster over whatever. And again, you know, one thing that I want to uh, conclude with is that our value systems are really, really messed up. So what about a beautiful soul? What about a beautiful, kind heart? Doesn't count. No, that doesn't Doesn't count, count, right? Because what about a beautiful, generous person? What about empathy? What about uh, anything, anything, wisdom, creativity? So... I think it's really important that we start looking at beauty from a different point of view. And we all know that when, um, when, we're, when we're with somebody very beautiful and they don't exude the light, when they don't exude anything really all that valuable, the beauty doesn't really sparkle no. too long. It starts fading. Because it comes from the soul. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our society has become so superficial. And I really blame the media. The media has presented people that are photoshopped. The media has all kinds of unrealistic, distorted, distorted people right. so that people want to, these are their idols. These are their yeah. television idols, their movie yeah. idols. They want to look like that. And we focus on the form. We don't function. We don't focus on the function. Yes. And what you were talking about is the function. How much do we value empathy? How much do we value genuineness? Well, you know? I th- I'm hoping more and more because in a world of human disconnect, I think that, and I think this sh- this particular show is proof of it because we have so many people who really are attracted to the idea of healing human disconnect because the other way of the superficial is just not quite cutting it. So I know we're just about out of ta- a time, yes? And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And thank you so much, Dr. Thank Barbara you. Pavlo, for, sh- for being here again. 
uh, as a very welcome guest. Thank you. And uh, and, and again, um, the audience, you're just so with it. And uh, you guys are really thinking like a shrink. Uh, it's beautiful for me. You have a great to, audience. I do. I and do, your audience has really read your book yeah. and has listened to what you have to say. I'm very learning. impressed. They're learning. With yeah. their their ability to articulate, you know, their thoughts, their feelings, yes. and interact with you. So I think All you've right. done a great job. Thanks. Okay. I look forward to seeing everyone next week. And uh, it's about healing human disconnect. Thank you for tuning in.